franchise secrets, Eric Von Horn. If you're not a part of the Franchise Secrets Facebook group, what are you waiting for? It's FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. I cannot believe how valuable this group turned out to be. When someone asks a question, the feedback is honest, authentic, very helpful, and it's from multiple perspectives. If you're not sure that you're getting the most accurate information about franchising, then check out the largest, most helpful Facebook group in all of franchising. Whether you're a Z, a Zor, a buyer, or investor, join our free Facebook group at FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. Welcome to Franchise Secrets. I had a fantastic interview with my good buddy, Darcy. We got into all kinds of things. This guy started out as a Subway franchisee. He had eight locations over a 15 year period, and that is just the beginning. All of you in franchising think that is the end. That was just the beginning for him. He went into an amusement park, more real estate deals, and warranty business, which by the way, that just means cash cow. Got that uh, a really cool story on how he got into that, how he got a, a large uh, customer for that, and then got into another business, which he just exited for multiple eight figures. And then uh, we talk about passive investing. Darcy's one of the guys that got me introduced to passive invest in terms of apartment syndication deals. And then I got him in, introduced into things that are way beyond apartment syndication deals, tax saving strategies, and a lot of other really cool things. So we talk about if he's uh, an, a visionary uh, or an ops guy, if he's a risk taker, the time that he did go all in for kind of a, a little bit more risk averse guy, he threw all the chips on the table and you'll enjoy the outcome of that. So I think you're going to enjoy this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast with Darcy Harbot. So I'm here with my good friend, Darcy, Darcy Harbot. Um, <laughs> he said, what are we gonna talk about? He's got a computer full of notes right now. It'll be fun to see if we hit any of those notes. And I said, we're just gonna go. So does that make you uncomfortable? Um, with you a little bit, yeah. Why? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, Why would that make you uncomfortable? It, it really doesn't. And whatever we're going to talk about, you know, hopefully I have enough information that's got value to your listeners. So are you a visionary or are you like an ops person at the core of who you are? I think I'm a better ops person than a visionary. Really? Yeah. When did you realize that? Um, you know, I got, I got started investing really early and um, I was, you know, I mean, I'm able to take businesses operationally by uh, buy them and improve them. Yep. And so I've just noticed like I've been in the subway franchise business. I've been in the real estate business, been in the bar business, been in the uh, amusement park. I business. know that we'll get into some of the yeah. amusement park business in a little bit. That's kind of funny Fun yeah. and funny. Yeah. So I, I just recognize that, that I, um, I'm a pretty good operational person that I can go in and make the company better and more efficient. And, um, in, without even growing sales, I can, I can increase profit just through efficiencies and processes. So it started out with Subway, but you've done some significant businesses as well, besides uh, some franchise. Franchises were the start, and we'll get into that. Give us a sense of, of revenue of some of the larger businesses that you've been a part of. Of gross revenue? Gross revenue. Boy, um, you know, starting backwards and going forward, uh, and keep in mind, we're going, a lot, we're going back quite a few years. <laughs> we're going back 40 years here. Um, early days and, and I, thought, I think I was just about ready to be born. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Uh, you know, early revenues were, were my first homes that I bought and, yeah. and fixed up and rented out. They're pretty small. You yeah. know, you make yourself 20, 20 grand a year or if you sell, you know, net profit, net profit. Yeah. So in, in, in running all the way up, the subway businesses were really good. Um, we had eight of them. So we had eight stores and, uh, they were well ran. We had good people in. My my whole family was involved. Revenues on those, I'm kind of trying to remember. We're probably in the gross revenue. I would say we were about oh gosh, four or five million dollars. But again, we're 20 years back, so that's 20 year yeah. four or five million dollar yep. valuations 20 years ago. In gross. Um, recent ones. What, what would a net on something like that be back then? Oh boy, um, trying to remember again because it's 20 years. So. I would say that we were probably netting somewhere between 20 and 28% in, in the subway business. Mm -hmm. 
and from what I hear today in the franchise space, um, Subway, the, the term that I hear now, because I've stayed in touch with a few franchisees, and they said, all the good money's gone. I don't know if that's true. But back in the earlier days, um, you know, we did pretty well. We worked really hard, but we did really well. That's interesting. Well, I think we'd like to talk about that at some point too, just like the good money's gone. There's a time to get out of some of these things when there's changes in the economy, the environment, consumer behavior, uh, supply chain, whatever it is. So that'll be an interesting conversation. Now then moving forward, you get, you you took your money there yep. and then you deployed it into other businesses outside of franchise. And I think for all the listeners, this is something that I think we should all be paying attention to because just because you're in franchising right now doesn't mean that's where you're going to stay. And you might like be in and out of franchising at different times. So you were in, you were out of franchising, in franchising with Subway, and then out of franchising. I don't think you ever went into franchising again. No, no, I didn't. You know, I want to say this. This is really important. When I, my wife and I were in the Subway business for 15 years, and we had eight stores. One of the things that I, I didn't recognize in the moment of those 15 years of operating the Subway restaurants was the processes that I learned. So. Prior to Subway, I didn't have any experience in terms of processes. It was just all, you know, gut feel, things like that. And I went to Connecticut where, where for two weeks where the Subway school is, went through the whole process, came home, ran the stores. And um, 15 years later, we sold it. And we went into some other uh, businesses like the, the amusement park followed Subway. And from the Subway experience, even, even to right now, where we're at in, in our lives, my wife and I, our lives, um, the processes have proven from Subway, the systems have proven to be really valuable in all of my other businesses. So EPI, you know about EPI. Yep. We had a pretty big exit here not too long ago. Give us a sense of an exit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much? Oh, like, not you don't have to give exact numbers, but just give the yeah. listeners a sense of the exit. Because in 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 Sola, we had an, a, a a lower eight figure exit when we when we sold that. That, and I had that with four different partners, and that wasn't all profit because we owed money on different things as well. But it was a you know it was a, a lower eight figure exit. Yeah, this was a multiple eight figure exit, um, and you know we had a good multiple. It was a great company. I mean, the, I didn't have it for sale. I had people coming to me and asking. You know, we we're you go back about six, nine, twelve months ago. Um, that was the market then. People, people, the Blackstones in the in my case, it was Morgan Stanley. That oh really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I didn't listen to the. You talked about this in the Investor Mastermind. Yeah. And I need to go back and listen to that. So this is this is kind of new to me. We're friends. We've been neighbors, and we've never really. I've knew all about the business, but I don't know about the exit. Yeah. So multiple eight figure exit. Yeah, multiple eight figure exit, and we. We weren't for sale. So now we're, we're jumping off Subway and the processes, but going over to EPI, another company that my wife and I owned for 18 years, and we just recently sold, as I mentioned, um, multiple eight, eight figure sale, but we weren't for sale and I wasn't prepared. The company wasn't prepared to be for sale. It's kind of like if you think about your home, you want to paint it and, and replace some of the carpets and get everything cleaned up. I didn't have time to get my house in order. So great business, really profitable, well ran. Uh, average employee was there for uh, 13 or 14 years. So just, a, you know, there was very low turnover, Monday through Friday, full benefits, you know, all that stuff. So good company. And people were coming and knocking on my door and saying, we're interested in buying you. And it's like, well, you know, you, know, you want to take a look under the hood and, and give me an offer, I'll listen. So I ended up uh, narrowing it down to two prospects. And we, we, went, uh, we went a long ways with one of the prospects, but toward the end, um, things we could, there's a couple details we couldn't get sat, we, I, we couldn't get together on. So we ended up departing and then the, the second buyer came in and, and that worked out pretty well. Were you, do, were you dealing with both buyers at the same time or no. one fell off where you, you couldn't agree on it? You guys both chose to walk away and then the second buyer came along. So multiple people had knocked on my door prior to signing an LOI. I signed an LOI with the company. They're a great company. I would like to have done the deal with them. But again, we just couldn't come to terms on a few things. Um, and I had an LOI with them. So I was obligated and could not do any negotiating with anybody until the LOI expired. Um, we went right down to the wire with that company where we were trying to get together on these last items. And uh, it ends up it didn't work out. So 
once that LOI was done, I just reached out to the other company and said, we weren't able to get the deal done. If you're still interested, I'd like to visit. And they were interested and fast forward, it worked out really well. That second company moved really fast. They they closed the deal and here we are talking about it today. How long did it take them from the phone call like, hey, the deal fell through, we're ready to ready to, to work with you, LOI to close? Yeah, it, I, it was less than 90 days, which wow. is pretty fast. The other yeah. company I was working with, oh my, it was nine months, maybe approaching a year. And they, it was a long process. Do you think you going through that process with them helped you be able to give stuff faster to Morgan? Yeah, yeah. I, I we, 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 we were able to get through the curve a lot faster through that experience on the first go around. So takeaway from this is franchise franchisee with Subway, 15 years, eight locations. And I didn't realize it was eight locations. In my mind, for some reason, I was thinking two or three and I was thinking probably five years, but you know, obviously that was longer. And then that's a significant time. That's longer than I'd been with any franchise. My longest was 10 years with Liberty Tax. So, and I still remember a lot of my time. So I'm sure that's still kind of ingrained into your memory, you know, 15 years with Subway. And you're talking about the systems and processes that you learned there. And I think that's important because when you're with a more mature brand like Subway, and I know it's a lot more mature now than it was back then, but still it was a significant system. Fred DeLuca was involved with it. Um, and they had uh, a solid brand, solid brand name that you learned a lot. And I think this is important for franchisees listening here. You are probably learning more than you think you're learning uh, about business working with a franchise. Like that franchise is teaching you things that you're applying to your business and it's just normal to you because you're in franchising right now. But once you leave franchising or you start your own thing, you can take a lot of what you've learned and make your new business a lot more successful because of that. Any comments around that? Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, it, you, your franchisees that are listening to this today, um, they, they know what, the, the the franchisor requires and you've got to run by their rules otherwise you get written up etc but <laughs> or terminated <laughs> terminated yeah that, that but the beauty of of what you're learning today and again you may not even you may not even be aware of what you're learning today but i can assure you that as you move on if you move outside the franchise space in your future you'll be able to carry over what you learned in the franchise space to any other non-franchise business as we mentioned earlier, that's what happened to me. So with Subway, I could tell you how many cold cut six inch sandwiches we sold on Tuesday, July 14th, 2006. And it was that detailed. We could tell you our food costs, our labor costs, all the things that I believe your franchise probably can tell you. But when you move outside, outside the franchise space, um, most people that don't have that experience don't have the discipline. Of, of the processes and and they they don't develop the discipline either it's easy to be lazy so my carryover to my other businesses the amusement park epi uh, uh, cmc motorcycles etc we i force my uh partners if i have them i have a few partners in a few and i'm just my wife and i and others but we are drilled down to exactly what our profits are, what our sales are, what our gross margin is, what our net margin is, what our inventory looks like, what our moving parts history looks like, what our fast moving parts are, what our slow moving parts are. And all of those things help you make a better decision in your business. And so the VPI company that we, that we just talked about and that uh, we recently exited, that company, um, I, I sold that in uh, for about, trying to think roughly, roughly 12 times what I paid for it when I bought it. Wow. So I, I essentially had almost a hundred percent annual return for the period of time that I own that. Um, and I'll take that any day. And that's, yeah. And that's just on the sales price. Yes. Yeah. Not even what you're making yeah, and, along the way. And it was, yeah, it was, a. Uh, it was a cash cow. It was my cash cow. Yeah, <laughs> it was your for, cash cow. Sure. Yeah. So let's talk about how you found that cash cow. Because I remember you telling me a story. Um, it was years ago, probably three, four, five years ago. Five, no, no, no. It was actually five or six years ago. Because time flies. Yeah. And I remember you. We were having coffee, and you said, "Eric, I learned a long time ago, be the guy that gets the call." I think that's what you said or something very similar to that. Yeah. Put yourself in the position 
to earn that phone call to earn the phone call yeah. i like that is he that's earn is better than get yeah and put yourself in the, into the position to earn the phone call yeah tell everyone what that means so um yeah, i'm gonna go back to when i you know quickly graduated from high school uh went to a local community college took out some college loans bought some real estate so <laughs> you wait wait you bought you borrowed money to go to college and you use that money to invest in real estate. I used it for down payments. Yeah. <laughs> we'll keep that between us. <laughs> yeah. That's no one will ever know about that. Yeah. Or I could definitely blackmail you. Anyway, well, keep going. So I ended up owning a bunch of real estate in the local community. Uh, values went small way community too. By yeah. the way, this isn't, you weren't in Austin, Texas. No. You weren't in San Diego. Give us a sense of how small that community was. Uh, approximately 8,000 population. Northwest so. Northwest Minnesota, very conservative. Um, not the easiest place to build wealth in a small population. See, I think that's important because we all think, I remember thinking, I can't do real estate in Spearfish, South Dakota. We got 10,000 people here. And and then I was in Virginia Beach and like, oh, I can do real estate here. And, and I started to do it, but there's disadvantages of doing it in large markets as well. So the point, the takeaway here is, you, if you're in a small town, that's how Darcy took his money, invested in real estate in a small town that wasn't the easiest to get to. I w was it a destination center? Was it a you know big big name companies moving in there for different reasons, or is it just a small town? Small town. We did have Articat, the, so snowmobiles, ATVs, side by sides, etc. They weren't in side by sides at the time, but I was going to the local community college. Articat, which was the largest employer in town, I think at the time had two thousand employees working there. So a manufacturing town, um, they uh, they were bought by Irwin Jacobs. You might know that name, but corporate raider guy, and he liquidated the company. So I graduated from high school, went to the local community college, and that same year, um, Articat closed down. So it just devastated the community, and that's when I borrowed money f uh, f uh, from school loans, and I took that that money. It was twenty five hundred dollars. And I was able to buy three homes. I wait, used, wait, 25 or 2,500 or 1,000? 2,500. <laughs> and I was able to get, put down payment because so real estate went on sale when mm -hmm. Articat went out. Things were going 50 cents in the dollar. Banks were taking homes back. And it was similar to 2008, but on a, on a tiny scale. scale. Yeah. And I was able to buy three houses. I, my, my first house was a $5,000 house, total cost. <laughs> and, I, and I put down $500 on a contract <laughs> for a deed. And what's so funny is I lived in that house for my, the whole time I went to college and I got a roommate. My payment was $84.99 a month. And, <laughs> and I got a roommate and uh, my roommate paid me $125 a month. So it was like, it's not interesting. Um, he's making my house payment and I'm making an extra $50 a month. So I, I thought I would try to duplicate that. And so I started buying houses. And there's a little bit of good fortune too, but when we're talking about earning earning the right to get the phone call, you also have to take some risks along your course. Um, try to be calculated, don't be foolish. But I looked at it as that Articat's gonna come back, and it did. Some people got together, pulled money in, started it up, and the company came back, and today it's, it's roughly a billion dollar company. It's owned by Textron, which is a $15 billion company. So real estate came back, and the houses I was paying five thousand dollars for, and fifteen thousand dollars, and eighteen thousand dollars for, I was selling for forty-five, fifty-five, sixty-five thousand, and and several of them I was I was debt-free on, and so I had that money in my hand. I think I was, I think I was twenty-two or twenty-three at the time, and I had, I can't remember, like seventy-five grand in my pocket, and that, again, that's that's forty-year-old money, so it's, <laughs> that's probably I don't know if that's. 250 grand in today's dollars. But anyway, I used that uh, to make some other investments. And that's how I, I got into a bar. I got into Subway with that money. Um, and so, you, you know, there's a little luck there because Articat came back mm -hmm. and things went up and I, I was in the money. So that's that's how I got my seed money. But I did cut my teeth in real estate. Uh, and that's, that's where my love and passion really lies uh, because that's where I started. So we'll get back to earning that call how you got API, but did you have any failures along the way? Cause like you, you took risks, 
you had some luck because if you do you either have good luck or bad luck and yes. that's going to happen at yes. some point have you had any failures along the way things where you've lost money in a deal a house a business a a car, a motorcycle, a garage. Uh, I, I'm 100% sure I have. I don't remember any, but the the, the, the losses or the failures I've had have been small. Yeah. This, like maybe I bought a motorcycle for $1,000 and sold it for 600. But that that's something I would never remember because the number is so small, would right? Would you say you're risk averse? Um, I, I, or has that, or were you risk averse? You know, I, I asked my question, myself that question and I'm not risk averse at all. I, 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 I'm, I take a lot of chances, especially nowadays, but I'm in a position where a loss won't hurt me much. Back then, um, my philosophy when I was 17, 18, 23 years old was, I'm young enough that if I completely fail, I have a long enough runway in front of me to start over. It didn't matter. And with like that first house I bought, my parents were kind of freaked out. Like, what are you doing? How are you going to pay for it? And I said, well, I'm going to rent it. Oh, okay. And they just <laughs> didn't understand that. And I. My philosophy was I can mow I can mow yards and make eighty five dollars a month. So I thought the risk was pretty low. Yeah. But I do ask my question myself that same question and and I probably could be wealthier today than I am had I taken bigger risks, but I took more calculated risks, conservative risks, risks that I might have got a black eye in terms of boxing. You might have got punched in the face but never, never got the KO punch. Mm. And I always was careful that way, that if, if this blows up on me, it'll be painful, but it won't put me out of business. It won't bankrupt me. And that was, that was how I behaved. And, and I, I, I look back and I think that was a good sound way to build wealth. But today I, could, I might be worth double had I taken greater risk mm. and greater chance. Or I could be paying lot rent in a trailer court too. I think there's, I think, what is Warren Buffett's rule? Don't lose money. Yeah. And second rule? Look at rule number one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So there's, and as you and I do a lot of investing these days, we, you and Justin Donalds taught us just how to protect the downside and, yeah. and, and just, just de-risk different deals. So we'll get into that here in a little bit. But so here you are, um, uh, bought real estate, Subway, it, you give us the, the, the end of the story of earning the right to, to uh, get that phone call. So the quick building, Perfect. yeah, the quick building is, you know, the real estate in college, you know, it, it, it gave me the stepping stone to the bar, which gave me the stepping stone to the amusement park, which was in a, in a different community, Brainerd Baxter, Minnesota. That, that is a, a, a tourism market. And while I had the um, amusement park, I had worked something we haven't talked about. I worked 18 years at Articat oh. in their marketing department. So when we had the subways, mm -hmm. I, would, I had a full-time job at Articat in marketing, which is a fabulous job, grateful for the opportunity, got to travel all over North America, learn a bunch, also learn a bunch in the franchise space at the same time. We were putting in mega hours, as you could imagine. And, um, and when I left Articat, I resigned and went, went to the amusement park. I left, uh, there's some things that I wasn't really happy with at Articat and I could have left walking out the front door with one finger in the air, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't. And I left on the highest ground I, I could. Well, it's not any finger, but there's a certain finger. Yeah, it's somewhere you, in the middle. Yeah, somewhere yeah, in the yeah, middle. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't do that because uh, I was really, truly grateful for the opportunity Articat you had enough, has given me. You had enough perspective to see the everything leading up to the thing that probably could have uh, cause that that uh, reaction to leave with that middle finger as you walked out the door, but you had enough perspective to see all the good things that happened over the course of that time. Yes, I would say that's true and accurate. So by not burning that bridge, and there's a really important lesson I'd like to share with your audience. Yes. Again, don't burn bridges. It's so tempting to do. It's so tempting. But as this turns out you know, later in my life, it turned out to, to be the smartest and greatest thing I ever did. So I left Articat, went to the amusement park, and um, they were having some trouble in some space that I used to handle for the company. So they called me, said, could you help us out? We'll pay you whatever you need, come back and help us out. And in the amusement park space, summer's the busiest time of the year. So we were exploding busy. And I did go back. My wife was not happy about that decision. <laughs> and I uh, went back to Articat, helped them with the, the problems they were having. They said, what do we owe you? And I said, you don't owe me anything. 
I'm so grateful for the opportunity you guys gave me that uh, this is the least I can do. So that I, I, I did that out of genuineness. I did. How many hours did you put in? Like how much time did you put in to not get oh. paid to not do that? I would say, you know, it was on and off here and there, uh, but I, I would say I probably gave them a, I'm just, I'm guessing off of fuzzy memory, a month, maybe six weeks of my time. Significant amount of time. Pretty, but, but it was spotty. It was some here, yeah. some here, move, you know, travel there for us. It was spotty. Um, and uh, as it turns out, um, one of the jobs I did at Articat was extended warranty. And I handled that part of the business in the marketing division. And um, when I went to the amusement park, one of my friends that's, that was on the other side of the table that provided the extended warranty coverages, we bought them and put them on our ATVs and snowmobiles for our customers to have mm -hmm. a longer warranty. Um, as it turns out, uh, the, the, the guy calls me from, from GE, General Electric, and says, hey, we Which have- Which was a vendor to Articat. To Articat, yeah. And he said, would you be interested in maybe starting a business with my idea? So we talked about it. And I said, uh, long story short is I went and pitched Articat. I, I knew the business. I knew what they're paying. I knew the service they're getting. I knew all the details. And I was able to give them more coverage for at the time, again, going back quite a bit, quite a ways. I saved a million and a half hard dollars, got them better coverage and better service. So they so, so they they gave me the business, and as that turned out, expanded into Canada, expanded into uh, uh, American Suzuki. Today we have CF Moto. We have a lot of different. You still clients. have that business. Yeah, yeah. It's a great business. And had I again thinking going back about walking out the door with one finger in the air because I had one little issue that would have overshadowed all the great things Articat did for me and all the all the experience I had, I didn't. And as a result. Again, I didn't know that my friend was going to call me and say, hey, and as a result, that's turned into a, a, a major piece of, of, of my history in terms of business and, and income. So hearing that story reminds me of things that my parents did in business that were counterintuitive to business. They did things and most people don't know about it, but the way they treated vendors in business, the way they treated competitors, like amazing things that they've done and I think about the law of reciprocity and like they probably wanted that. How much do you think the law of reciprocity played into that? Them want, you gave them something, them wanting to open up that door for you. You obviously saved them a million and a half dollars, but like how much do you think that played into everything? Just that open door? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't know a percentage, but I think it was really important because when I moved from the amusement park into EPI, mm -hmm. Um, uh, there's just a number of people that I dealt with over my career from real estate to Articat to Subway to the amusement park and the EPI came for sale. Um, this is where we come full circle and say, how did you, how did you, how did earn you that earn goal. that right? How did I earn it? Um, my parents, you know, I think did a good job bringing me up, good ethics, good morals, be grateful, all of the things we're talking about. But by not stepping on people along the way and being genuine, and 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 ethical with them it it gave that phone call came because of that behavior that i was i was um putting out in the, in the world i had to get um uh uh what's where i'm thinking i had to get um testimonials yep so imagine if i would have you know gave the flip off to Articat versus the way i did handle it <laughs> they gave me a great testimonial and that's a that's a national brand that gave the seller of the company the confidence that mm -hmm. they could trust me. It gave the realtors that were listing that property the confidence that they could trust me. And then, all, you know, same with, same with Subway. So I was able to give references off of Subway. I was able to give references um, from a number of different businesses I'd been in that my behavior gave or earned me the right to get that phone call because if I would have behaved poorly at Articat or poorly when I left Subway or, or not did what I said I was gonna do in all my other businesses when I sold the amusement park, if I would have behaved poorly, um, those testimonials would have never allowed me to buy that business. And by behaving the way I did and being genuinely grateful and ethical, um, that earned me the phone call from all of the people I dealt with right to 
the um, uh, brokers and seller of EPI. Mm -hmm. So uh, I look at that as I earned the right to get that phone call by my previous behavior. That's one of the things like, you know, I've learned a number of, of things from you. And that's one of the things that I've, that I've learned. And I remember calling you and or texting you and or having coffee with you and saying, Darcy, I just earned the right. And there's been multiple times that I've earned that right over the last five or six years that you told that to me. I would not have recognized it unless I had that conversation with you. So I hope the listeners out here take this away and be like, be the person that puts yourself into situations and is that person that can earn the right to get the phone call. And I have equity deals with franchise brands now because of that. I have investment opportunities because of that. I've, uh, you know, there's been multiple business deals because of that. And I've, and I've recognized, and I don't do things to get that. It's who I am, it's who you are, but I do recognize it when I do get that call. Yeah, your performance and your behavior and your philosophy and personality have, have earned you the right to get those phone calls. And, you know, we, we talk, we're both on in Justin's podcast, mm -hmm. right? And, and, the number of phone calls I get from mastermind members, just the mastermind members, is surprising to me. Yep. But it's because I there's I have some hard lines. Honesty and ethicalness yep. is them, and for some reason it it apparently portrays out of me at that mastermind because of the calls I get, and they they are calling me to ask my opinion. Now I, I love that, and I'm flattered by that, but I'll, I can assure you that of the 100 members in that mastermind, somebody's gonna call me and say, will you come on this deal with me? Yep. And that's that's the earning the right philosophy. Yep. So yeah, I love that. I do too. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, one of the things that, like I'm doing so many things with investing now. I've been in so many more deals than I've ever been in. Um, I have this mastermind with Justin. Uh, you're in, you know, uh, investing mastermind. Uh, a lot of my uh, my start in investing was a conversation that you and I had that helped me understand apartment syndication deals way back when. And then I just went, you know, went deep into that, into other things and in investing. And so you kind of got your start in investing and it started with kind of real estate, apartment syndication and, and some other things. So. Give me a sense of your uh, investing philosophy, kind of how you got how you got started, and then just let's come full circle where we are today with investing. And so, because a lot of this, there's a lot, Darcy. There's a lot of people on here that have businesses or, or they're early in franchise. Let's say they even have a corporate job. They go from a job to being a business owner to being that entrepreneur where the business is working for them. Then they want to get to that investing category. You and I are both at that place right now where we could live in the investing side without doing anything else for the rest of our lives. We choose to do business because it's fun and we choose to be an entrepreneur and build systems and businesses with systems because we can make more money to invest more money. But if we wanted to live off of the money that's sitting in these investments, you and I could both do that right now. So, but it all started uh, at, for all of us, at some point, there is a catalyst that got us introduced to the in world of investing. What was that for you? Well, in, in terms of um, passive investing, passive investing. Yeah, not stock market, <clears throat> not crypto, passive investing. Well, what well, was you? I don't we've talked a little bit about that that in the past, but I mean, you called me and said, hey, I've got this guy that's really interesting. It was Justin Donald, right? Well, even before that, it was real estate, oh. wasn't it? Wasn't it those, some of those apartment syndication oh. deals and the hotel oh, yeah, deals? Yeah, it was. Was that the yeah, first yeah. thing for you? Um, I mean, you've done real estate, but I would say that's probably more active. I've done real estate, that's more active. I think a lot of people get confused when I talk to them about investing. They're like, oh, I trade options. I invest in real estate. I buy houses, I flip this. I'm like, that's still you. And the way I think of passive investing, just to be super clear, kind of morbid, but if you died, I died, that money is going to continue to work yep. whether I'm here or I'm not here, whether I'm on vacation or I'm somewhere else or God forbid something just happens to me where I can't talk on the phone or do the things that I normally do, use my brain for different things like, or just, you know, I'm checked out for whatever reason. The, the passive investment still makes money without me doing anything. 
Yeah. So uh, I'll skip the the me investment, but the, like the syndicated stuff, what I'll call really is getting more out there mm -hmm. than than individual investments between yep. you and I or or your listeners. Correct. Um, yeah, so I have a, a friend and a, a partner. He's a GP and I'm an LP. Um, so that means general partner and limited partner um, in a deal. Yeah, general partner has all the control. GP is really an investor and might give some advice and mm -hmm. be on the advisory board, things like that. Um, we become friends, but I've been investing with Brian Klein from yep. Providence out of Bozeman, Montana for the last, oh boy, it's I, I, 10 years, maybe it's more than that. but. That's really where I, I got my education and, and experience on syndicated. And we're in hotels yep. and apartments. So we do all new new build Marriott's on the yep. hotel side. We don't buy existing or rarely unless it's a really great value. And same with the apartments, they're all new build. And we have, it, it's just been a really good investment. Let's walk through. So that's how we both got started. And this is where I think a lot of people get started in hotel syndication, apartment syndication. And there's some good ones out there. There's some bad ones. And you have to be super careful right now because we are, the interest rates are going up. People, if they haven't been punched in the face, lost a bunch of money or have advisors that have done been there, done that before, they might be, it might not be as good as it once was. Or they might be losing some some money in some of these deals coming forward. But um, so just a word of caution out there, but there's a whole world beyond real estate, multi-unit apartment syndication type deals. But let's talk about one that you and I both did. Uh, we won't give the city. Uh, it's an up and it's a city that's not a massive city. It's not Austin, but it's a really cool city. Um, it's kind of off by its own, a lot of tourism, a beautiful area. We uh, both went into this deal, and it's a it's the probably the highest end apartment uh, complex in that city. Would you say? Yeah, Class A. Just I'm so proud. It's the type of property I want to show my mom when she comes to town and go and check this out. And that city, by the way, is is um, the number one medium sized city in the U S. in terms of people coming in. So, so we like. So when you're looking at deals like that, you want cities like like that. This isn't. Uh, uh, where is it? Thief River Falls. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't Spearfish, South right. Dakota. This is a beautiful mid, 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 mid size market. But we both went into that deal, and it's the first high end apartment b from the ground up that I have that I've done. And the deal wasn't as lucrative in terms of the terms as some of their previous deals were. And that's pretty typical when syndicators start getting a lot more investors it's just supply and demand they have a lot more supply of investors so the they don't need them as much and the deal terms get less uh less lucrative but anyway i went into that deal let's kind of walk through so how long were we in the deal before we got our full money out that because it was refinanced roughly we'll do rough numbers here yeah Darcy. we'll do rough so i'd say I, so that, that was a big apartment complex. It had, uh, I, I think it was 396 units. There's two phases. Yep. Uh, phase one, I, I think, started in 2019. Sound right? Yep. And um, made my investment and uh, got some of my friends in it. That's always risky, but it turned out to be yep. awesome. Uh, I think we had, and keep in mind, when you, when you build a new uh, a huge property like that, a big apartment complex, it, it takes two solid years to build it. And so as they start turning buildings over, you can start to lease up, but it's really about three years between putting a shovel in the ground and taking in rent. It's really close to three years where you're ramped up. Um, we received all of our capital back in about three years, mm -hmm. three and a quarter years. And then we uh, received some distributions and uh, the the property has been appraised recently. Um, I believe I can't remember if we paid sixty five or eighty five million to build it. It'd be pr pretty good value in today's. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, so let's just say it's eighty five million. The the part the product was appraised just recently at two hundred million dollars. So all investors have received their money back. We've received an annual uh, an internal rate of return. I believe thirty seven point some percent. And it was just appraised at two hundred million dollars. So if we if we sell today and 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 the partners are considering it, um, we'll probably have. I'm just guessing we'll probably have a five x in five years. Five x in five years off of apartment syndication deal. And a whole bunch of depreciation. <laughs> yes, we Which like is that. Awesome. Yeah. But that gives you a sense. A lot of people out there are thinking. 
oh, internal rate of return. And they don't, they don't, they just don't look at the a five year plan or that. They just look at what's going to happen year number one or year number two. And looking back on that, I think that was a, that was a fantastic deal. Is that like the best syndication deal that you've done? Uh, like, I don't want to cherry, like, if that's a cherry picked one, that's the best, then let's let the listeners know. But if there are others that are today where we are with it in terms of the valuation, is that, are there others that are similar to that? Um, that's one of the better performers, but there are several other that are in that category. So mm. it's like the Great Bell Curve. Um, there's a there is a hotel in in uh, Hillsboro, um, uh, Hillsboro, Washington. Okay, um, Se and, that's Seattle, right? Seattle, yep. And just a suburb outside there. That I'm in that deal too. Yeah, it we got our money back, but it was a it. Gosh, it was a seven year deal probably before we got our money back and we really didn't make any money. So there are some deals where where you know we go back to Warren Buffett, don't lose money. Mm -hmm. We didn't lose money. We lost time value, yep. but we didn't lose our capital. And that's a big deal. And when that ha happens, and it's gonna happen, you we, we yep. you and I know Naval Ravikant if you don't <laughs> look him up. But the philosophy is is you know, being a lot of investments, so some are gonna do just kill it. That's 20%. 60% are going to sit here and do well, and 20% aren't, just aren't going to do well. And there, that that hotel is an example. Just didn't do well. But when that happens, I'm very happy just to get my capital back. And uh, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen yep. in some of the Justin deals. Yep. I I think I've shared with you. I'm in over a hundred different LLCs. When when did that did that accelerate once you once you know I got you into some of these deals with Justin and whatnot? Is that like how many deals were you in before that, and how has that accelerated in the past two years? I'd say there's two what I'll call defining moments that are relatively recent. 2008. Mm -hmm. we, we all know what happened in 2008. Um, I I just happened to have a pretty big war chest of cash, and in fact I bought EPI, the company we've been talking about in January of 2009. And if you remember, the, the world was falling oh, yeah. apart. I mean, people were freaked out. I went through with the deal, but the banks came back while I was working on that EPI deal. And they said, given the circumstances, we need more collateral. So I literally pushed all of my housing assets and all of my other companies, I, I, the, the warranty company. Every, if we're at the gambling table, all the chips got pushed in. I was all in. All in, and it was like, here we go. Well, that that. So when we talk about risk averse, um, that wasn't very risk averse. <laughs> I. Uh, but long story short on that is, so 2009, 10, 11. My philosophy was, the the economy is going to come back. I just don't know how fast it's going to come back. I live. I've lived long enough to see the patterns, and there, there there's repeatable patterns in history that you can recognize. Mm -hmm. And if you've lived long enough, you see those patterns and you recognize them. In 2008, nine, I recognized them. Not only did I buy EPI, which was a pretty big purchase at the time, I was buying commercial buildings and other real estate. So in 2009, 10, 11, and 12, those four years when everybody was panicked, they were still, everybody just sat on their wallets. Banks weren't giving loans easy. I was buying a lot of stuff. I accumulated more assets in 2009, 10, 11, 12 than my whole life previous mm. to that combined. Wow. So that's a defining moment. And the economy came back, prices went up, I made a killing. So that that's one defining moment. The other is the conversation with you about this guy that you should listen to his podcast. And I did and 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 I've shared the story with you a couple different times, but it was Justin Donald. And um, that turned me into so Justin, just so you know, and he's gonna finish the story. Justin's a good friend of both of ours now. Uh, Justin has a book called The Lifestyle Investor. He's been on this podcast. The two of us have a mastermind together for investing and Justin's got a mastermind for investing as well. So keep yeah. going. His name, I introduce you to just this guy yeah. named Justin Donald. I named Justin, like, you know, everybody's got a guy, right? <laughs> so I did listen to it and, and it was it, it was really, I was really intrigued. I got hooked in. And with, with Justin's podcast and mastermind, mastermind really, is that you learn the world of alternative investing versus stock markets mm -hmm. and 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 uh, mutual funds. You know, all of the brokers across the world are selling that product. I understand why they have to. It's not that they're bad people by any means. 
they have people people's retirement money. They have to be careful with it. So you get a six, eight percent return, 10 if you're lucky. But in an alternative investing, we start talking about regularly getting 20 percent returns. Mm -hmm. People that are in in the stock market look at us and go, you're crazy. <laughs> but once you learn alternative investment, it's no different than me buying those first homes. Mm -hmm. That really is a form of alternative investment. I'm simply off on my own and I'm not in the stock market or where the masses of the population are going. So uh, Justin, his mastermind, you, your, your podcast and mastermind is all about alternative mm -hmm. opportunities. And um, there's a whole nother world that if you're not in the alternative space, space at least inquire about it and learn about it. I, uh, my, my wealth and opportunity, like 2009, 10, 11, 12 that I just mentioned, is also that defining moment in, you know, I'd say uh, 19, 20, 21 range, current market today with, with Justin, the mastermind, um, is exploding. I, I, there, and there's so many other things that I've learned from taking your um, retirement. Again, some people are going to think that dude's crazy. <laughs> but taking your family retirement, your 401ks, your simples, your IRAs, et cetera, and going self-directed. I've done, I did that about a year ago. It's one of the best things I've ever did. And there's just so many other opportunities that you learn from a hundred different people mm -hmm. in a mastermind. I know real estate really well, but other people know SaaS technology really mm -hmm. well. And, and you get exposed to these opportunities that are just incredible and they're out there. And the truth is they're really not any more risky. And in my opinion, in many cases, less risky than the stock market. Yep. What have you, what are some of the aha moments that you've had talking to experts, tax mitigation, tax strategies, um, and whatnot, uh, that you did, like, what have you learned about that? You don't have to give names. You don't have to give specific strategies because we talk about that in these masterminds, but are there ways that you are saving money, saving in taxes, deferring taxes, estate planning that's different today than it was three years ago? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we all get depreciation if you buy an apartment building or a house or whatever, you get some depreciation, but there's ways we all know accelerated depreciation, mm -hmm. but there are other strategies. There's, you know, I'll just mention a few. They're, they're pretty complex. They're too complex to go into mm -hmm. detail today, but one is a defined benefits program. If you own a company, if you own your franchise and you're an operator and you're getting killed on taxes because you're doing well, um, look into something that's called the defined benefits program. Yep. I have that. I like that. It's been, it's a good, good strategy. It's a good strategy. It's a tax play strategy. Yep. It's fully legal, federal IRS yep. compliant. And you can invest in a lot of different things Yeah, like that you can, and it, it helps you kind of regulate your tax burden each year too, because you can choose to put certain amounts in. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. And, and if you're, if you're CPA, ask your CPA, what is defined benefits? Ask your CPA about a captive insurance company. It may or may not be the right tool for you, but ask about it and learn about mm -hmm. it because it's a fabulous, mm -hmm. it's a fabulous tax deferral play. And the longer all of us can hold on to our money and use it toward other investments to make 20% a year, the more money we make. But once you give it to the government, it's gone forever. So, yep. so it's I like losing money. It, yeah, it is. It's it's gone. It's gone. You cannot. So if I can save a million dollars in taxes and put it to work for five or 10 more years on the investments that we do, and I can get 20 percent for five or 10 more years on a million dollars, you can do the math. That's a that's a lot of extra money. And there's a time value of money and that brings it up. And there's there's the rule of 72. Look that up. If you don't know it, look up the rule of 72. Um, it's just simply if you're making 20% return annually, divide it into the number 72. It's always the number 72. And that will tell you how fast you double your money. So 20 goes into 72 about three and a half times, roughly. Mm -hmm. You're going to double your money. If you can get 20% return, you'll double your money every three and a half years. If you get a 5% return divided into 72, what is that? 12, 13, 14, it's about 14. It's going to take you 14 years to double your money. And so, I mean, that's how I look at things. Um, 
there's another, there's something else that I wanted to, to ask you. I'm trying to remember what it was. Caleb, we're going to cut that out. Let, can I, um, while you're thinking, let me jump into something. So as I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I, and I really enjoy it. And a lot of people on the podcast talk, uh, the, the, the host talks to the guest about you know, what did you do? And you know, we go along the whole story that we've kind of went along. And one of the things that I think about is I want to try and deliver some value. I don't just want to tell my story. I want to try and deliver some some nuggets that your your world and, and the people that follow you can go. Uh, that, that was worth listening just for that. Well, I'm going to grade you on that. So what are some of the value bombs that you want to deliver? Um, You've uh, delivered a bunch, by the way, yeah. like what you've been doing throughout this whole thing is delivering value. I know that and I'll hear that. And I'm excited to share some of the feedback that I get from listeners with that. So like as the guest, you've been delivering value this whole way. Is there anything that you think that the listeners should know that you haven't hit on yet that you think would be valuable to them? I'm not sure what wealth level your listeners are at. I'm, I'm sure it goes from you know A to Z, but it's everywhere, man. It's everywhere yeah. from just getting started, people making make, making money with a job to people that have hundreds of millions of dollars of an, of net worth. Yeah. So here's what I'll say is, I, I think about myself as as a listener and go, how, how did how did Eric get in this position where he can live the lifestyle he lives, and how did Darcy get in that position? So, um, it, at the Sodak, at Shing and the Shing. <laughs> the Sodak Shing. Yeah. Um, so I shared this with that small group, but if you don't, if you didn't come from a wealthy family, I didn't. I'm the first wealth builder in my family. You may be, I'm not sure. But here's the thing is, how do you get to my position or Eric's position? And you, you, have to, you have to have some franchises. You might have to have eight, eight franchises. You have to go through the work and the pain of running and operating your business if you don't have parents that can shove a bunch of money to you. And that's, that's what I've had to do. So you'll, I use the analogy like the shindig. Go up to Alaska, there's a big pipeline up there. That's where the oil comes in. It gets put in that pipeline, and that pipeline goes down to Houston, Texas. You pour the oil in the, in the pipeline in Alaska. It takes a long time for that oil to start coming out the other end in Houston. But once it starts coming out the other end, as long as you keep pouring oil or investment mm -hmm. into this pipeline, dollars, dollars it's going to keep coming out on that end. And if you stop for a year or two or three or four, there's going to be a bubble in that pipeline. So uh, the, that's, that's my, the simplicity of how I think is, is start putting investment, money, dollars into the pipeline up here and don't stop. And even when it's painful and when you want to buy that boat, or that new house at age 25, 30, 35, 40, be patient. Um, keep the investment going because the, the more the more oil, the more money you can put in the front of that pipeline early, age 20, 21, 22, 25, 35, the bigger and the, the more oil or money that's coming out in Houston, right? So that's important is, and so how do you get there? My story is, you heard it, I, I went to community college, borrowed some money, said, I have nothing to lose, took some risks, bought some houses, worked out, bought a bar, worked out, was working a full-time job while I had the bar, while we had the subways, finally cut the cord from the full-time job when we bought the amusement park, got into the uh, EPI business, got into um, other, other hotels, apartments that we've just shared, <clears throat> and now the alternatives. If I would have started buying the boats and the cars and the nice houses and the big trips at age 25 or 30, when I was making some money, I would not have the wealth I have now. And when you go with the rule of 72 and start looking at that, you look at how fast your money doubles and how many years you have to build wealth. Um, you can put that on paper and it's astounding because it's the we can go the, the penny a day and double it every day. You know what I'm talking yep, about? Yep. I think we all know that, you know. A I don't know if everybody knows that. Well, I'll give you, the, the option is, is you, I'll give you a million dollars or I'll give you a penny a, a day 
for 30 days, but we'll double it every day. And so you get one cent and two cent, four cents and so on. And on day 27, if you chose the penny to double every day for a month, on day 27, you didn't make a very good investment. But it's day 28, 29, 30 and 31 that make the magic happen. And that that on, on day 27, let's say it's a million. So you, you would have been even on, on taking cash versus the penny. But then it's two million, four million, eight million just in those four extra days. And that's how it compounds in terms of business and wealth. So the more you can be disciplined and invest when you're younger, the, the, the more when you're 45 and 50 years old, and I know it might sound like a long time to some of you, but I tell it to my children. And I, if I could give anybody any advice, I'll say be disciplined in the early years and live live like a king or as Dave Ramsey says, live like what is it? Live like live. What, what is that saying? All right. Dave Ram. He's probably not going to like a lot of this investing advice that we gave, but live. I don't know what he says. I, it's like live like oh, man, Some, like, something about live, live today, live like no <laughs> live like nobody else today so you can live like nobody else tomorrow. So giving up, you know, you know, 40, 50 hours at the corporate job, going to Subway, going to all these other businesses we had. I, I, I wasn't living a, a great lifestyle, but it, today it lets me be in the top 1%, maybe in the top 10% oh, yeah. of the 1%. It's the 10% of the 1%. Yeah. yeah, it's not the 1%. Yeah. And, the... <laughs> yeah, and so now I can go to Europe for a year and come home and there'll be millions of dollars added to my, my bank yep. account. And that is the difference. That's got a little. And that's a huge difference. And I think if you have not been introduced to alternative investments, think passive investing, this may seem like too good to be true. It might seem it just doesn't make sense. But once you start getting introduced to it and you start dipping your toes into it and start doing some deals, putting 25K, 50K into something and do that year after year, all of a sudden, you don't want to buy a boat. You don't want to uh, buy this buy this other depreciating asset. By the way, boats have gone up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but in most years, these depreciating assets slash toys, you want to invest them into deals. And I've done that, and I continue to do that. I have the toys. Like compared to other people around where we live in our little town, I have a lot of toys. But compared to a lot of my friends outside of our bubble here in Spearfish. I have no toys or I have the B toys, not the A toys yeah, yeah. and I'm comfortable with it, but I've gotten addicted to investing into deals. Yeah. And I, I'm not recommending you don't live life. Um, you, you've got kids, they're young, take them out on the boat, yep. take them on vacations. But again, just be balanced. That's exactly. A, that, no. And I get that you're you like I have a boat. My boat's up. I don't know. I paid 130 grand for it, which is a lot of money for a boat. but my friends, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars for a boat. I could do it, but I choose not to. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good balance. It's yeah. a great balance. Can't go back. I, I have a I have a few toys in my shop too. Um, <laughs> but but I waited quite a while to get them. That's it. You've wait you've your your shop garage is worth more than most people's houses around here around anywhere, anywhere in the world, it's going to be worth than most more than most people's house. And you got beautiful garage uh, bikes in there and cars. And it's just really cool. It's cool to see just to hear more of your story. Some of it I didn't know. We'll have to email this to some of our local friends here so they can hear your story. Mm -hmm. um, and then they might, uh, uh, you know, go up there and well, you might have to put a put a lock on that garage because we don't lock our doors here in Spearfish. We don't. So um, we will not tell you where his garage is. But Darcy, it's been fun having you on the show, man. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. And uh, it's always good to see you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.